The story of James Buchanan Eads, one of the greatest engineers this nation has produced. A man of indomitable energy, courage, and initiative. Born in Lawrenceburg, Indiana in 1820 of sturdy pioneer stock, he very early in life gave evidence of his genius as a mechanic. In his teens, he made a short trip on the Ohio and was so fascinated with the steam engine that furnished the power for the Little River steamer that he persuaded the good-natured engineer to explain in detail its construction. For several weeks afterwards, young James devoted every moment he could spare to some mysterious occupation in a shed back of the house which he proudly called his workshop. One day, he was surprised by a visit from his father and his grandmother. Well, Jim, what mischief you into out here? Oh, hello, Pop. Nothing. Hello, Grandma. Hello there, Jimmy. Oh, you seem to be making a lot of noise for a boy who's doing nothing. Uh, what's this contraption you got over here with smoke coming out of it? Why, that's my steam engine. Steam engine? Yes, sir. Uh, just like the one on the river steamboat. Only a whole lot smaller, of course. Want to see it run? You mean to say it'll run? Sure, I just got the steam up. Now, see, I, I open this valve here... Well, I declare. <laughs> That's pretty good. Did you make it all yourself? Yes, sir, every bit. And I made a locomotive, too. Yeah? Wait till you see it. I keep it in here. Uh, will that run, too? Sure, on those tracks there. Just a minute now. Here she comes. Toot, toot. What? Say, look at her go. <laughs> but I don't see any smoke coming out of the smokestack. No, I couldn't make the steam engine work in the locomotive. <laughs> then what makes it go? I'll show you. Oh, there. You see, the tender's really an oblong box with a lid. Now, look inside. Uh, well, what's that? <laughs> well, well, why, she fainted. Uh, Granny. Uh, here, get, Granny. Get some water. Get some all right. water, quick. Oh, here, yeah, here, no, no, here, here's now. some. A drink it, Granny. Get it out. Now, now, she's all right. Uh, where is it? Where is it? It was a rat. Oh, sure, Let me out of here. Sure, it's a rat. He works the treadmill, which is connected up with the wheels. He's trained. Well, for mercy. <laughs> the Jimmy Eads locomotive. Capacity, one rack power. <laughs> when James was 17, the Eads family moved to St. Louis, where young James got a job in a dry goods store. Later, his health failing, he left the store and went to work on a Mississippi River steamer. And from that time until the end of his life, the father of waters was his all-absorbing study. Soon afterwards, he went into business for himself to salvage cargoes of vessels that had been wrecked and sunk in the river. His first job was an attempt to recover several tons of lead submerged beneath the lower rapids of the Mississippi. It took practically his entire capital to hire an experienced diver from Buffalo. And we find him now at the age of 22 with his crew on board a rented scow anchored over the wreck. The diver has been lowered over the side. Easy there, boys, with that air pump. Remember, too much air is almost as bad as not enough. He's sure going down in a hurry, Mr. Reed. This light line's playing out plenty fast. Now look, he's signaling. He wants to be hauled up. Give Come me a hand boys. with the captain. Come on. Come on. It, it sure works hard. All together now. Come on. Ah, here he comes. Here, help him over the side. There, that's it. Now hand me that wrench. Here it is. Oh, don't stop the air pumps till we get his helmet open. All right. Well, Carter, what's the matter? Did you run into trouble down there? Oh, I couldn't even get to the bottom, Mr. Eve. The current's so strong that I was swept down by the river. Well, then you'll have to have heavier weights. Oh, no, that won't do any good. Even if I did succeed in getting down to the wreck, it'd be impossible to work in that swift current. Besides, it's too dangerous. I, I wouldn't attempt it. Well, then what can we do? Well, the only thing to do is to use a diving bell. A diving bell? Well, great Scott, man, that's out of the question. I'd have to send her to Buffalo, maybe New York for one. That'd take time and more money than I can afford. Well, it's either that or abandon the project, then. But my entire capital's tied up in this venture. Oh, wait a minute. I know what I'll do. I'll make a diving bell. You'll make one? Sure, out of an empty molasses barrel. Molasses barrel? Oh, say, are you crazy? Well, there's no reason why it wouldn't work. That's all the first diving bells were. A large barrel open at one end. Oh, no. We'll get one that's big and strong, fasten weights to it, attach the air hose, and we'll have a perfectly practical diving bell. Miss Eads, I want to tell you right now, I won't risk my life by going down in such a makeshift contraption. Oh, you won't, eh? No. All right, then, I'll go down in it myself. And 
So down he did, with such success that the entire sunken cargo of lead was raised and a handsome profit realized from it. From this small beginning, Eads built up a great salvage and shipbuilding business. His reputation spread, and at the beginning of the Civil War, he was summoned to Washington. On his return to St. Louis in the latter part of 1861... Welcome home, Captain Eads. What news do you bring from Washington? Serious news, Walter. The Confederate Army is displaying unexpected strength and stubbornness. Oh, uh, did you receive my telegrams? Yes, sir. The orders for timber have been placed as you directed. Good. I stopped off at Pittsburgh and Cincinnati and contracted for steel and machinery, which will be shipped at once. We have orders to build eight ironclad gunboats for the United States Navy. A million-dollar contract. That's a big job, sir. And they're to be delivered in less than four months. Well, that's impossible, eight and four months. Nothing is impossible, Walter. This war has got to end, and we're going to do our share in ending it. The eight gunboats, the first ironclads ever owned by the United States, were completed in the incredibly short time of 100 days and turned over to Commodore Foote. In February 1862, General Grant embarked with his army at Cairo, Illinois, and convoyed by Commander Foote and his fleet of gunboats, steamed up the Ohio and into the Tennessee River to within a mile of Fort Henry, the western outpost of the Confederate Army. There, Grant landed with his troops, and the gunboats proceeded slowly up the river toward the fort. We can't go much near the fort, Commodore Foote. Why not, Captain? The enemy's cannon has longer range than ours. They'll blow us out of the water before we can get near enough to do them any damage. What time is it, Captain? Just 2.15, sir. Well, Grant, by now, should be in a position to attack the fort from the rear. Signal all gunboats. Full speed ahead. But, Commodore... You have your orders, Captain. Yes, sir. Signal full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. Aye, sir. Full speed ahead! <laughs> Commodore, we're hit. Yes, but unharmed. The ball didn't even get our ironclad side. Why, George, you're right. But that's amazing. How close would you say we are to the fort now, Captain? Less than 500 yards. Listen. Grant's attacking from the rear. Signal all boats to open fire. All boats fire. Fire, sir. All boats fire! All boats fire! All boats fire. Look at their walls, riddled with our cannons. Their artillery is practically useless, and we haven't suffered a single casualty. Thanks to Captain Eads and his ironclad gunboats. Fort Henry was soon forced to surrender, and then Commodore Foote and his fleet materially assisted Grant in the capture of Fort Donelson. The war over, Eads next turned his energy and genius towards a gigantic task of peace the spanning of the mighty Mississippi River at St. Louis. He constructed a monstrous steel bridge supported by three arches, each span being over 500 feet long. This magnificent structure, started in 1867 and completed in 1874 and costing with its approaches $10 million, ranks as one of the finest bridges in the world. Then, as a result of his exhaustive studies of the Mississippi, Eads evolved a plan which he submitted to the Mississippi River Commission. But the Army engineers ridiculed his ideas, so in 1875, Eads went to Washington personally to urge the commission to approve his proposals. Gentlemen, the immense sandbar at the mouth of the Mississippi is caused by the deposit of silt and soil carried down by the swift current. Yes. A deep water channel through the sandbar will enable ocean-going vessels to steam up the river to New Orleans and beyond, Mm -hmm. thus opening up the great Mississippi Valley to world commerce. Quite true, quite true, Captain Eads. We know that the water over the bar is only eight feet deep in places, far too shallow to allow passage of large steamers. But the dredging is of no avail. The river is constantly depositing more silt. I don't consider dredging, sir. I intend to force the river to dig its own permanent channel through the bar. Of course it is. How can you accomplish that? Gentlemen, it's well known that a stream confined between narrow banks flows more swiftly than when allowed to spread out. I propose to build two parallel piers or jetties, 1,200 feet apart at the south pass of the Mississippi, a mile out into the sea from Land's End. The stream thus confined will flow so swiftly that the gravel and stones it carries 
will gouge out a channel through the soft mud and silt of the bar. Mr. Chairman, I have been advised that the Army engineers have studied this proposal of Captain Eads very carefully, and they considered it absolutely impracticable. I believe that we should follow their decision. Yes, it's very good. Right. Gentlemen, I am so certain that my plan will work that I'm willing to undertake the project at the risk of my entire personal fortune. What? All I ask is your authority to proceed. If I fail, it will not cost the government one red cent. But Eads did not fail. The river, flowing swiftly between the two jetties, cut for itself a channel over 30 feet in depth. The cost to the government was $5 million, a small price indeed to pay for opening up the great inland empire of the Mississippi Basin to world commerce. The Mississippi Project was the crowning achievement of James Eade's colorful and brilliant career. Yet, he continued extensive engineering operations both in America and Europe. In 1884, he received the Albert Medal of the British Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures, and Commerce, the first American so honored. In 1887, he was engaged in another great enterprise, the building of the ship railroad across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in Mexico, when death forever stayed the hand of one of the world's truly great. James Buchanan Eads, Captain of Industry. <laughs> 